Good evening. Welcome to the new symposium. Civil discourse in the pursuit of truth. The case of women in the public has changed dramatically. The role that we play in my family's lifetime. When my mom graduated from high school in the late 60s, 60s and went to college, it was not unusual for young women to be going to college to get their MRS degree. In fact, uh, at that time, 58% of four-year bachelor's degrees went to men, about 42% went to women. By the time I graduated high school in 1992, it was declared the year of the woman because the number of women in Congress after the Clarence Thomas, Anita Hill hearings quadrupled. But realistically, not much had changed. Half of my classmates dropped out of college before I graduated to get married and have kids. Today, we see a very different picture. 57.3% of college graduates last year were women. Exact reversal of the numbers when my mom started college. It's a different world. Women make up just over 50% of our country, almost 51%, and yet they're closing in on 60% of the workforce. It is fair to say, I would think, that we are entering not the year of the woman, but the generation of the woman. When I talk to my mom, who's in her 70s now, about her college experience, uh, she attended a small, private, religious university, much like Friends, and she discusses how she would have to kneel on the ground to make sure that her skirt touched the ground was long enough. And today, our young women are asking, why is it that we are banned from wearing spaghetti straps and leggings that are appropriate for the weather because they're distracting to the boys in the class, but the boys are not banned from wearing pants that ride below their butts and tank tops, which can be equally distracting to us girls. This generation is woke. They are aware of what's going on around them. They are asking questions. They are paying attention in a way that the last couple of generations, mine included, have not. And I think that's a big part of why we are seeing some of these changes. The Me Too movement, the discussions of rape culture, the, the makeup free movement, the discussions of what equal pay for equal work really means. And are we getting there or not, not? And these are very deep discussions that can take a long time. And I could sit here and talk for not only a short introduction, but the nine minutes that each of the women up here is allotted to make their opening statements. So I will shut up <laughs> because I was invited here to moderate, not to talk. Uh, this is the way it's going to run tonight, is each woman gets nine minutes to make an opening statement. And then we will, after each statement, if I or any of the other women here has a question for clarification, we can ask that. We're not going to be digging at each other about individual stances. We're here to listen to what each other has to say, not to try to convince them of what we believe. There is a difference, and it is a part of polite discourse that is often lost in the public today. We need to learn, I think, my personal opinion here. I, I'm not big one for putting out personal opinions <laughs> as a journalist, but my personal opinion as a society, we need to spend a little bit more time learning, listening to learn, not listening to respond. It makes a big difference in how you see things. And the way I see it, that's what tonight is all about, is listening to learn. So, our guest tonight, we have Becky Elder, who is a native Wichita, an Olympic caliber swimmer at Arizona State University, um, graduated from University of the South, uh, part of their first class since 1851 to include women. Uh, and you have been married for 40 years, have eight children, a dairy barn, a farm, 
and much more. And then next to her, in the beautiful red coat, which I am so jealous of, <laughs> we have the Reverend Karen Robe, Robe? Rob? Rob, Rob, uh, Associate Minister for Plymouth Congregational Church, um, has her Master of Divinity degree from Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa in 2013, has, spends a lot of time with Wichita's Music Theater, uh, directing, et cetera. Once again, I continue to be jealous. <laughs> And then in the blue, which is absolutely just as beautiful as the red, we have Lacey Stevenson, a teacher of the Bible and wife of a pastor, uh, served on staff as a groups minister at the Village Church in Dallas, Texas, earned a theological master's from Dallas Theological Seminary in 2015. And at the very end, wrapping us up, we have Jenny Wood, songwriter, performer, who is based out of Wichita here. She's open for groups like Joan Jett, Gene Simmons, from KISS, for those of you who don't know. Johnny Lang and Martin Sexton, among others, traveled the world as a guitarist and vocalist for various bands. Needless to say, a slightly different perspective on things than our biblical scholars. Uh, all in all, I think we have a very diverse group up here, and we are going to start with Becky, if you would like to take your nine minutes and tell us kind We're of... missing someone. Can, yeah. we, can we say that? Yes, yes. We are supposed to have Brandy Calvert here, a local activist and founder of the Women's March on Air Capital. Uh, I'm not sure what happened. I'm sure it was vitally important or she would be right. here. Well, we're missing one voice, and it's always good to have more voices. Yes. Uh, my nine minutes are going to be as uh, uh, unreflective of my own profound opinion as they are. Uh, I want it to be didactic. I want the evening to be exactly what we said. It's a, a time to listen to learn. And my opening thought is it's way too early to judge what we are. Uh, the, the march of history teaches us uh, about things that are long considered, uh, carefully weighed, parsed, measured, uh, put put in perspective in, in a much more healthy uh, way. So I feel like my contribution tonight is to uh, give you a little historical excursion of the woman. And uh, I, I love what I was able to do. I was very, very ambivalent about the topic. I didn't like it. Uh, and I wanted to, uh, I wanted to turn Mike's invitation down, but I, I kept getting more and more interested, and I called on so many of my friends, and I had so many wonderful lunches sitting and talking about it that I finally just said, well, this is really gonna be fun. <laughs> and so here you go. Here's, here's what I found. There's three, there's three ways that society is organized. Uh, family as a division of labor, the state as the preservation of rights, individual rights, and the church as relational identity. Now that sounds a little weird, so I'm going to come back to it, but I'm going to flesh those three things out. Uh, family is a division of labor and the woman taking her place. Uh, the state as the secure uh, the, the, the institution that tries to secure by the exclusive use of force, I better say that, your rights or make you take your place. Uh, and identity in the church as relationships. And the church being the community of people, all right? We'll make it really, really broad. So, first and foremost, uh, the earliest human beings, girls rule. Dad's gone hunting all the time. And girls do everything. Uh, then you come through the fog of history to the Sumerian culture, uh, where mothers are highly prized, of course. Um, women are free to move around in society quite freely. Now, we aren't going to make a lot of socioeconomic distinctions here. We're simply going to say that, that by and large, women are valued. Uh, they are held up 
as part of a productive society. Now it happens to be the family. There's not a strong state, okay? The, the family has the exclusive use of force. Fathers can kill their daughters. But you have, to, you have to go back in history to be honest about what a woman represents. So Samaria, they're valued as mothers. Uh, marriage is very protected. Egypt, who wants to say Cleopatra with me? That's a pretty easy thing to see the ex exaltation of, an, of a woman who is given advantages, kind of like we are with universities, but she takes advantage of every advantage she has, and she does her work uh, uh, internationally, too, if you've read enough Shakespeare or enough history. In, uh, in Babylonia, we have monogamy, which protects, it's enforced, it, 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 it's, it's uh, all the culture puts the woman uh, in a uh, very free place. Uh, the, the goddess Ishtar comes from this place and is an, a presiding feminine figure. Uh, Assyria, we have uh, very high birth rates, militaristic, militaristic uh, society. Abortion is prohibited. Uh, infanticide is, is practiced. Uh, but the woman is productive, okay? I'm trying to get you a few words and help you build some categories. Uh, then we come to the Christian era uh, in Judea, the virtuous woman, the Proverbs 13, uh, 31 uh, woman is, again, she is incredibly industrious and productive. Persia, uh, the, the standing of women is very, very high. But they are, the, the nuance there is the woman is sequestered. She's being kept from the world uh, because she is highly prized. And again, you're thinking harems and you're thinking, you know, kind of a, a, a bad thing. But don't do that to history, okay? Just look at the value of the woman in the eyes of people who are organizing society. Uh, India, early very freedom oriented. Women are very highly uh, mobile. They are allowed to participate in many, many places. Uh, China, it's starting to get a little stricter. Japan, uh, we're seeing a little more subordination. Uh, then you come to Crete. Uh, we talked about clothes. You know the great picture of the Cretan woman, the Cretan woman with bare breasts. They walked around doing anything they wanted to do. Women were uh, very free. In Homeric Greece, uh, the Acacian leaders uh, want to uh, fire up the Greeks, you know, the Troy, the, uh, the war in Troy. Uh, they use the beauty of women. They don't use political jargon. They use the beauty of women. Uh, we go on to Sparta. Sparta is the very, very best. Men and women, almost no distinctions whatsoever. Athens, you have the famous, the famous feminine figure, Aspasia. Aspasia. She lectured Pericles, Socrates, uh, Anax, and, uh, Anaxor, Anaxagoras, and Anaxagoras, Euripides, and Al 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 Alcibiades. Uh, she is an Athenian woman. She's able to do what she wants. She speaks to men freely, horizontally. Third and fourth, uh, from the fourth to the third centuries, uh, we have, uh, we have uh, uh, no abortion. We have infanticide. So again, the woman is very highly valued. Alexandria, uh, the house of Aphrodite, women move freely around. These are just my notes to bring you through history. You have Caesar and Christ, the age of faith in Rome. Somebody else will speak to that. But women are at their pinnacle in the age of faith. They are given absolute e equality with men under God. In the Renaissance, we start to experience affluence. And an interesting thing, if you let history speak, when affluence starts to happen, generally, the decline is women decline in their position. They are not protected. They are, they are allowed uh, to move around 
in a different way, not in a valued way, but in a common way. Uh, the Reformation, again, brings forward the issues of the church, and the church presides with its ethic as it was established at the time of Christ, and that is a very horizontal way. So what you see in this excursion through time is that women have been valued for their ability to produce. Don't let that leave the conversation tonight. We have always been valued for our ability to produce. It just depended on what the whole culture was producing. I believe women have been placed in a position right now where money is their highest productivity measure. And we need to leave that behind. Now go back to my initial statements and then I'll be done. Family, the state, and the community or the church, the, the voluntary association. The family has a way to organize itself and call a woman very productive. The state, with the exclusive franchise on force, can force a woman to be productive, can force a woman to be equal. But I would be very reticent to hand over any of my rights, any of my personal advantages to somebody who can force somebody else to do something. I don't like that idea. I would rather remain free to accomplish what I believe is the most important job we all have and which the church best exemplifies and the community, remember the extended community as the church, we're a body of people together is relationships. We will only find our value, we will only find our highest productivity, we will only find, as women, our very best advantage by knowing everything about the people around us, encouraging everything about the people around us. And this isn't sloppy, syrupy thought. This is a distinct, it's a distinct methodology. You can, if you know the people that you work with, become the most powerful presence that you can be. You will never be marginalized in a relational society. So my, my, my time tonight uh, is to tell you that history has said that the woman is valued, valued highly, valued by different measures, but that's what history is best at. And in the contemporary situation we find ourselves, we had best be careful to impose something uh, that we have not yet finished thinking through. Thank you. All right. Does, before we move, move on, does anybody up here have any questions for clarification? No? All right. Karen, you look ready to go, so I'm going to let you go. Okay. <laughs> I would like to thank uh, Mike Witherspoon and the New Symposium Society for asking me to be a part of tonight's event. I admit I had not heard of the New Symposium Society before Mike contacted me, but was thrilled to discover that there was a group in our community whose goal was to promote civil discourse. I have been saying for a number of years now that it is something that in this country we are severely lacking. I was surprised when Mike said the group was looking for an all-female panel for the conversation on gender, and then I realized, as I received more information about the possible questions that were posed for us this evening, that our conversation is really not one on gender, um, but it's more specifically on women's equality and the marginalization of women. It's a little disappointing to me that in 2018 we are still talking about whether women are equal or not, but here we go. Um, out of curiosity about the New Symposium Society, I took a look at their blog, and what I'm about to say really is not intended, it is not intended in a mean-spirited way at all, but rather to help us understand how women are marginalized on a daily basis, even when it's done unintentionally. The first thing that jumped out at me about the blog was that all of the quotes, and there are quite a few of them, were quotes by men. 
after searching the blog and a number of different pages on the blog, I finally found one Dorothy Day quote. And that made me curious, so I looked back over the past two years of the symposium's um, events to see what the makeup of the panelists had been uh, leading up to this event. And from what I could tell, there have been a total of 26 men and four women who have been panelists on topics including education, healthcare, labor, and divinity. 26 men and four women. I'm an ordained minister. I have a Master of Divinity degree from Phillips Theological Seminary in Tulsa, and I'm currently working on my Doctor of Ministry degree. And so I was particularly interested in the past discussion on divinity. I went to YouTube and watched part of that symposium. The moderator, as well as all five panelists, were men. And there really are women who would like to discuss issues other than whether or not women and men should be considered equal. <laughs> Being part of the conversation kind of goes along with the whole equality thing. But tonight we are stuck talking about the marginalization of women and whether men and women should be considered equals. The first question that we were posed with was, is the marginalization of women currently detrimental to American society and culture? How so? What should be done? I think the marginalization of any group is detrimental to society and culture. The very definition of the word marginalized explains why it would be detrimental to relegate to an unimportant or powerless position within a society or group, to treat a person or group as insignificant. When we marginalize, we dehumanize people. And when we dehumanize them, we see them as less valuable than ourselves and can justify behavior that we could never justify if we thought of them as our equals. One need only look at the history of slavery in this country or what happened to six million Jews during the Holocaust to know that that is true. Historically, the marginalization of women has taken the form of belief that the woman should be subordinate to the man, thanks in large part to the second creation story in Genesis, the story of Adam and Eve, a story that has been misinterpreted, particularly by Christians, and used to subjugate women for centuries. There was a time when women were not permitted to do what I am doing right now, address a public group of both men and, men and women. In 1637, Anne Hutchinson was tried and convicted of heresy and banished from the colony for holding weekly meetings where she led Bible study and discussion. Governor Winthrop described her as the new Eve. It was almost 200 years before another woman spoke publicly in the United States to an audience of both men and women. Women like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony, Lucy Stone, Sojourner Truth, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, Antoinette Brown Blackwell, and Ernestine L. Rose fought for a woman's right to speak in public and to vote as well as for other rights such as the right to own property. While we have gained the right to vote as well as most of the other rights of men, our history of marginalization and subordination has kept us from attaining positions of leadership. There was a Pew Research study conducted in January of 2015 on women in leadership, both in politics and corporate America. It showed the majority of people think even though women are qualified for leadership positions, there are barriers that still exist for them. The number two reason people think women fall behind men when it comes to acquiring leadership roles in business and in politics is that businesses are not ready to hire women and voters are not ready to vote for women. If women are qualified for the positions, why aren't businesses ready to hire them or voters ready to vote for them? In the process, I am currently in the process of writing a 30-page paper that links that lack of readiness back to the Adam and Eve story. Um, there are still faith-based groups who hide behind their religion in order to continue to subjugate women, uh, discriminate against women, um, denying them ordination and other leadership roles within the church. And don't tell me that those feelings don't carry over into the business and government areas. Uh, just a few statistics to show why I think we have an issue. The number of Fortune 500 companies run by women reached an all-time high last year of 32, or 6.4%. The ratio of male to female Supreme Court justices is currently one to three. 
106 women hold seats in the U.S. Congress. That is only 19.8% of the 535 members. The percentage of Protestant female senior pastors is only 9%. And of the 45 U.S. presidents to date, none have been women. The highest and hardest glass ceiling remains intact. This imbalance of power in upper management, government, and church leadership has contributed, in my opinion, to the epidemic of sexual harassment and abuse that is only now just being brought to the surface. Our second question was, should we emphasize male and female equality or gender differences, which might even be complementary? What are the crucial or foremost differences? What was most interesting about this question to me is the person asking has tried to force the answer in a direction they think the question should be answered. Did you notice that? The first half of the question is, should we emphasize male and female equality or gender differences? And then the second part of the question is, what are the crucial or foremost differences? <laughs> so I'm not going to take that bait, and I'm just going to say I'm all about equality. I'm not advocating for... I'm not advocating for the majority of leadership roles to be filled by women. I'm advocating for something a little closer to 50-50. I don't want a woman's voice in place of a man's. I want them both to be part of the conversation. Which leads me to the next question. Is there a distinctive feminine voice? And I would say no. There is not one female voice. There are many. It has been pointed out that during uh, that that the women during the women's rights movement of the 19th century were speaking from a privileged white perspective and they left out the voice of African American women. Our life experiences shape our thoughts and beliefs. The more diverse a group we can bring to the conversation, the better understanding we are going to have of the needs of this country as a whole. That being said, I believe there are certain topics where women as a collective group need to have, if not the sole voice, then certainly the loudest voice. A man is never at risk of becoming pregnant, therefore men have no business spearheading and defunding organizations that provide women's health care. So what can we do moving forward? For one, I think we need to do some self-examination. Look at the language you use. Is it inclusive or do you use words like mankind and brotherhood? When you speak of God, do you always use masculine language? Mary Daly said, if God is male, then the male is God. Take a look at who is seated at the table with you. For instance, if you serve on a board in the community, what is the makeup of that board? Recently, my church recognized that our board of trustees was made up of mostly men, and so some of the members were intentional about changing that. We each only have nine minutes, so I'm going to wrap up here. I want to thank the New Symposium Society for being intentional about listening to women's voices this evening. And I would also like to point out one more thing. I mentioned earlier that when I first visited their blog site, um, the page had only quotes by men, except for that one Dorothy Day quote. Knowing that the group was being intentional about listening to women's voices at this Gender Matters event, I went back to the blog after this symposium had been posted, thinking I might see some quotes from influ influential women. The first three of the five quotes were men talking about women. Thanks. Before we move on, does anybody have any questions for clarification? I did have one question that I wanted to follow up with. As you look at this panel, one of the things that you mentioned was during the women's rights movement, the marginalization of women of color, and as the only woman of partial color up here, <laughs> I want to raise the question, are there voices in this community that you would have liked to have seen on this panel if you were putting the panel together? Um, I did suggest Levanta Williams. Okay. She suggested Levanta Williams. <laughs> so I was hoping that it would be more diverse. 
Okay. Uh, I think I think we can solve that in the future. I think as the as the idea grows, uh, there will be uh, there will be more people to draw from. Um, I don't know that it's appropriate to ask uh, questions that I want to rise up out of the audience as well. But uh, I I do think that um, one thing that we need to keep thinking about is the definitions of leadership, the definitions of the conversation. Uh, where, where is leadership? Where does it come from? How does it work? In the fabric of society, there's so many other places than, uh, you know, we, we hear a lot from one place, but the fabric of society is very creative in defining these terms, leadership, and conversation, so that we say we don't have positions of leadership and we aren't part of the conversation, I think is limiting the, uh, the expansiveness and the, the uh, diversity that in which we can lead and in which we can speak. So. Sure, and I and I pointed out that the three places I think women's leadership is lacking is sorry is um, is in government, it's in corporate, and it is in the church. Right. Um, and that's where the decisions for society happen. That's where laws are passed. <laughs> I think so. it. I think it's great that. Mike kept changing the questions. I don't know if you guys noticed that, but every time we got a new email, there were new questions. So he was really, he was really trying to, you know, get us to talk to him a whole lot more about the questions. So I think we all noticed that, right? All right. Go for it. Karen, in light of just the lack of equal leadership that you see for women within the church, do you see any restrictions for women within leadership positions within the church? Or you're advocating for equality, and so... Sure. Do, do I see restrictions? Well, certainly, if you look at the percentage, like I said, in Protestant denominations that... that uh, accept women as senior ministers or in the minister position, senior ministers of a church, there are only 9% of, of women. So I think there is one thing to say, yes, we believe women are equal, but then when it comes to actually doing the hiring, because f at least 50% of people going into seminary now are, are women. Um, but it's not being reflective. What's happening is women are being they're in pastoral care, or they're in um, they're in children's ministry, or you know they're taking other positions as opposed to that top position. And if I can throw in my two cents on that one, <laughs> I happen to be Seventh Day Adventist myself, and my church is in the midst of a years long, almost decade long fight over women's ordination, and. It is an ongoing issue in a lot of your more conservative churches of whether or not to even ordain women. Um, there are several pastors, including a very good friend of mine in the Adventist church, that have given up their ordination because women can't be ordained. Um, allies, as they are referred to, uh, can be as big a part of lifting women's voices as women speaking up. Most definitely. Okay. Are we ready, Jenny? Let's do this. Okay. <laughs> Jenny's my confidence with the mic over here. Our foundation matters more than our feelings. Let's be honest. Our experiences and emotions prove to be insufficient, inconsistent, and often quite discouraging. Outcome of the final four, anyone? <laughs> and yet, a steady foundation, like the one hopefully in your house, proves sufficiency, strength, and utmost hope. Just as my fellow panelists have presented, I too am faced with limitations. I certainly am not an expert. I'm a Christian and an insufficient woman who is often quite ignorant. That said, while I can and will share some thoughts on tonight's issue, I can't share all thoughts. But the most important element I will speak to is the foundation of truth. While I don't intend to sidestep these questions that we've been discussing, we must first recognize that the answer to these questions stem from our foundation. 
I want to first lay this foundational groundwork as we continue the dialogue. What I'm presenting aren't the ideas, philosophies, and knowledge in and of Lacey Stevenson. And that, my friends, should be incredibly compelling and refreshing. There's an element of the Christian ethic that most certainly adopts and receives truth outside of oneself. I'm asking us not to consider the wisdom of man-centered doctrines and teachings, but rather God-centered doctrines and teachings. Now I will ask for your minds to be humble and gracious, for you to humor me and just gener generously consider that maybe we're missing the mark on this issue because we, people, are the problem. And if we're the problem, then the solution can't in fact be found in and of ourselves. We would all agree that there's much tension over this issue. And my hope tonight is that there would be greater unity that we might in fact be more complementary of one another rather than conflictive with one another. And so I'd like to first provide an introductory framework and initial concerns. Before one seeks to conclude at what's at stake on the issue of women's role in society and answer some of these perennial and practical questions, we must first discuss our foundational beliefs. Everyone in this auditorium comes to this conversation with presuppositions. And we must come to the table with a belief in the inerrancy, inspiration, infallibility, and authority of the Word of God. Friends, we have to start there. If we start with our personal background, our experiences, our feelings, or really anything else, we will find ourselves operating out of a sense of independence, free of authority, rather than submitting ourselves to the authority of the Bible. This and so many other issues are fundamentally related to the authority and truth of the scriptures. Now look, if you grew up in a broken home or maybe you had a dad like mine who committed adultery for over a decade, or perhaps you've suffered at the hands of a man in an abusive relationship, or maybe even earlier today you were treated unfairly by men in your workplace, I get it. There is often a temptation to then stereotype the male gender, label yourself a victim, and puff up your self-confident inner self, thinking that you can be the one to repair and reform and control all that's been fractured. You'll be prone to living in light of your experiences and your emotions. You'll start another campaign or tweet a new Me Too like hashtag, all with the confidence that it's up to you. And what a heavy burden. You must be exhausted. But what if instead we came under absolute truth to guide us in this conversation? What if we started here? What if we come under the authority of God's word, asking not what we think about the issue, but rather what does God say about men and women? Their relationship with one another, their purpose, their dignity, their identity. We look to our maker rather than to men. We, look, we lean and learn from perfection rather than learning from the problem. And so I'd like to provide biblical evidence and resulting theological reflections. And obviously given the time limitations, I'll briefly use the Genesis account. And in doing so, I'll affirm that neither the order of creation nor the naming by Adam nor the sin of Eve can serve as evidence that God intended a foundation of authority and headship between man and woman, but rather a complementary partnership. I'll close with briefly addressing the initial questions in light of this biblical framework. Genesis 1 gives us the creation account, and while there are fundamental differences between men and women, not concerning our value and identity, but rather in differing in roles and responsibilities, in the beginning God created both man and woman equally in his own image. Genesis 1 verse 27, and thus women are image bearers of God, made in the image of God to behold his glory. And yet while men and women image God differently, men and women both equally image God. The historical event of Adam being created before Eve doesn't suggest a pattern of male headship, and thus the creation order doesn't evoke a principle of hierarchy or authority. 
The man and woman were created sequentially in Genesis 2 to affirm that we have a need for one another, depicting an interdependent relationship rather than justifying an implicit hierarchy between the two. And then we see in Genesis 2, verse 18, that God creates a helper. And Eve is described as an etzer, and that doesn't mean that a hierarchy exists where a woman is inferior to man. Instead, etzer is the word that is often used to describe God as our helper. The word etzer thus doesn't suggest superiority of man and or the subordination of women, but rather a partnership, one of help and strength. And yet we all might get a little uncomfortable when Adam is commanded to rule over Eve in Genesis 3, verse 16. And yet, friends, this is post-fall. The Hebrew verb there, mashal, means to rule over in a manner that is powerful and control and domination. And yet this struggle between men and women is part of the human nature as a result of the fall. And this phrase to rule over might be given in fact of Eve's desire that she would have to dominate over Adam. And thus, we can't overlook the harmonious intimacy and unity that was present before the fall. Ultimately, friends, this conversation is one about authority. We must recognize the authority of scripture as it speaks to women. We must also recognize the authority of Christ over all of his creation, and it is with this posture of humility that we continue this dialogue. So where do we go from here? I'll propose three elements of response for us. First, an upward response that we would see God rightly and submit to the authority of his word. That we would come under the universal truth outside of ourselves and live in light of the scriptures rather than in light of our experiences and emotions that we would acknowledge the order that God has created, that God creates order in the midst of chaos, that he creates the order, we cause the chaos, and he commands the order. Next, an inward response, that we would see ourselves rightly, that we would acknowledge our insufficiencies and our missteps and our confusion and pride over this issue, and yet we would see that men and women are equal in dignity and purpose, and yet different in role in the home and in the church. And that we would see this beautiful design of genders made in the image of God by the creator, the designer, God himself. And lastly, out of the overflow of the first two, an upward response and an inward response. Lastly, an outward response. Part of the conversation tonight that we would see others redemptively. That we would seek to complement one another rather than conflict with one another. That we would support one another for the flourishing of both genders that we would see that the mistreatment of women in thought and word and action stems from disregarding the interplay of both our sameness and our distinctiveness. That we would celebrate that men and women are distinct yet dependent on one another. Friends, thank you for your time and for your attention. I'll close with the words of Tim Keller. Freedom is not the absence of restrictions, but the presence of right restrictions. Any questions for clarification? Okay, well, I have one. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of my job. <laughs> it is, I found, obviously, not surprising as a pastor's wife and as somebody who works within the church that your points are based within the framework of the church. But as the conversation moves outside of the church, we live in a multi-religious culture with faith beliefs of all sorts outside of Christianity, as well as those who reject any form of the supernatural uh, in our lives. How does that change your message and your approach, or does it? Thank you for that question. Um, I'll preface my answer with, of course, saying I don't necessarily feel like I can answer, I can answer this question explicitly but not fully and so I think what's important for us to recognize is that in a culture where there are many different belief systems if we don't come from the same if we don't have an objective truth outside of ourselves we will be influenced by culture and experiences and what's around us that is ever changing and thus I mean that's why I appreciated Becky's timeline of history so much because you see how this issue will just 
continue to change if we don't have a standard of truth that was true of those in all those different time periods that Becky represented. And so my message wouldn't change, the foundation doesn't change, and yet we see the influence of coming to this issue with not the same foundation and how it breaks down of the different societies that people come to the conversation from. All right. Well, thank you so much, Lacey. Mm -hmm. And Jenny. <laughs> okay. All righty. Um, I just want to say I'm, uh, it's very unfair that uh, you asked me to do this, Mike. I just want to call you out right now because I'm up here with some serious academics and <laughs> um, I am just a musician, so... <laughs> Um, I was actually hoping you wouldn't talk at all. You would just play for nine minutes. <laughs> and I can sing with you. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm more than honored to, to, to be up here today. Um, it's a good and, choice. Uh, also, I, I think I'm confused, Lacey, about when you said we can't draw from our personal experiences. So, uh, basically, I thought so much about uh, the questions. I thought about them so much that um, I, uh, I already got poor comprehension reading grades in school. And so I reread and reread and reread it. And then finally, and I prayed about it and, and I finally concluded that all I can go off of is my experience. That's all I can talk about. <laughs> so, um, so uh, and uh, from that, I, I wanna start by saying, um, at, when I was younger, I'll never forget seeing um, seeing on MTV bands play rock and seeing um, these guys be so carefree and they were playing and their amps were loud and they and they and their shirts were off and their hair and they looked terrible and they were so free I'll never forget seeing that as a 10 year old girl and I said I want to do that I want to do that um, and so from that dream I just held on to I always I, I want to be able to be that free, that genderless um, on, on stage, playing with my amp loud and singing with my heart. Um, so um, anyway, long story short, I, I played a lot. I, I tried school. I did. I really did. Um, I went to Wichita State for music theater and realized that I was not the yeah lady at all. <laughs> and uh, I like Tool and Nine Inch Nails. So <laughs> um, I, I uh, um, but I got a great education there and, and took that, uh, you know, the foundations of that experience out into the world. So I go and I play with all these people. I'm living in LA and I live in Nashville for four or five years and I'm touring with all these bands, all these uh, dudes. And um, I, I, I experienced, uh, um, I don't want to be a victim here. So my mother is, uh, passionate, as she says. She's Hispan AKA Hispanic. <laughs> and uh, she's very, uh, she's a, a feminist. She is looking, looking at her now. She is a feminist. She always, uh, men, if they talked, men were annoying. I mean, she, she's, she's over-educated, over, <laughs> um, and my father was a truth seeker. He was a, a, a judge and very stoic and calm. And, um, and so the duality of, of my parents, I've really struggled with because, mm -hmm. um, my mother, and she's not here, I know she, there's no way she would be here, she's at home watching TV right now, but uh, <laughs> she, not, I don't want to say that she was always a victim, but she would always find a way to <laughs> kind of um, um, see where she was being done wrong, and my father was the complete opposite, I mean, he was totally oblivious to if he was being taken advantage of, or he always gave people the benefit of the doubt, and always considered their stories as to why they were acting uh, in a way. So. Um, Anyway, so when I say these few examples of my, exa of, of my experience as a, as a uh, very awkward female, shy female uh, trying to be in rock music, these are the experiences that led me to the position that I'm in now, which is, I don't want to say avoiding, but I'm running in between hurdles. And before I used to think, God, it's so unfair the way that this, I walked in and the sound guy thought I was setting up a guitar for some other band that's coming in. It's for me, but okay. I mean, all these little things, what do I do? Stop and try to fight it? What do I do? Try to um, tr make songs that are, you know, um, aggressive and hostile and I, I spend all this energy trying to fight the, the wrongness of it and uh, from that and this is how the universe and God is so so amazing I had I, uh, one of the last full uh, all-male bands I, I toured with I wrote a little song called don't let them get in your head 
and I, I just kept singing to myself, and we would be in the hotel, I had my little hotel room, and I would kept singing to myself, don't let them get in your head. I'm not gonna be like, you know, but I, I, I kept singing to myself, and when I came back to Wichita, I have a lot of kids in my life. I have a mentally ill sibling, so I take care of her three children. Um, so I sing with them often. Um, when I started singing that song with them, and they were singing back with me, oh, the power that I felt, the, the, the feeling that I f have felt for so many years going into a venue and the venue owner or the booker talks, doesn't talk to me, wants to talk to the male in the band. In the emails, they don't, if, if I sign my name Jenny, I went under a pseudo, a man, uh, through emails for booking for two years and I got more gigs doing that. Anyway, just all the little things. <laughs> when I heard the kids singing back with me, don't let them get in your head, I said, there it is. There's my sword. There's my, there's my fight back to all of the times where I felt like I mm. should just be cute and small and quiet. Mm. So um, anyway, long story short, longer, long story long. Um, I, uh, I reached out to Wichita, that's why I love this community so much. Uh, the trust, the community that I feel here in this city, God, I'm so grateful. Um, I reached out and people helped me make a music video. And, um, and from that, school said, hey, come and talk to the kids. And now it's a whole, I do a whole full school assembly with a slideshow and I get kids, and it's a whole deal. Point is, I took the feelings of thinking I should just stop being loud on stage. I said, turn my amp down. Oh, I want to be a singer. How dramatic of me. What am I trying to do? What, why, why do I have to be so, uh, am I just making this all about me? Thinking that creative, uh, creative arts are a, um, a, a platform for you to be, you know, vain or something. And that's uh, this, that sickness that I, I genuine, genuinely believed because of how I was being treated. Um, all of that is gone, and it's an, it's an entity out here, and I see it, it's there, yeah. But when I'm with kids, and they're singing with me, and that power, that genderless power, um, is, is, is so rad. And I just, um, anyway, so that's come out of the, the situations of, of being a woman uh, in rock music. That, that is my, uh, I'm very grateful that that is my uh, power. So, um, so these little experiences, like I said, with the, you know, <laughs> Venue owners um, not wanting to deal with me, wanting to deal with the guy in the band. Um, and uh, let's see, this is this is how I see. They have, have bullet points, and it's all printed. This is mine. So, um, so uh, you sh in high school, I just want to say, uh, be, so being in, in, in music um, in high school, I, with my, I was very, I went over the top with my looks, and I tried to be just. I was homecoming queen. I was the whole deal, blonde hair. Ding. And then when I tried to take that, that care, that who I thought was, I was just, it was fine. I tried to take that into the world. Oh my God, the amount of uh, manipulation, and I had no idea. So from that, um, I have changed so much. I don't have a sexual preference. My gender, I don't know what I am, but, um, and I don't claim to cling to that because I don't think it's all about um, women and men. It has to do with. Uh, their stories. Why are why are people this way? Why are people treating? Uh, why are people? Uh, um, I'm getting off topic here. Okay, let's see here. So um, basically, I, I, to, to taking my gender, neutralizing it to make myself accessible to my, to the audience. Um, when I'm playing and I get my hair in my face and I'm trying to no sexuality, no, no, no. Trying to and afterward, the women trust me enough to. Uh, they women come up and they act, act like I'm a, a, their sister or their family member. It's so cool because I take. Oh, I'm trying to take away uh, the gender out of it. I'm tired of the fight. I'm tired of the um, the victimization. The why why um, you know um, why can't I be taken more seriously or this and that. Um, so I'm just trying to use uh, the the power that I've gained th through that experience, trying to make rock music with a bunch of guys. So. That's about it. All right. <laughs> that was a mess. Well, thank you very much, Jenny. I, I've got to say that your story speaks to me very loudly as someone who just feels like she's starting to find her voice after nearly 20 years in the business of speaking. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, it is not unusual just from my personal experiences to take some time and figure that out. And I totally want a copy of that song, by the way. <laughs> um, any questions for Jenny? No? 
All right, at this point, we will open it up for the audience. If you guys have any questions. Uh, all right, I think we have a question over here from Dr. Fox. So is this on? Yes. yes. It is on? Okay, I can't tell. Um, I want to force a conversation which could easily take up the remainder of the time, so don't let it do that. But uh, I, I want to force a conversation between the panelists about something that Becky made central to her presentation that I don't think any of the rest of the panelists touched upon, and which I'm not actually certain Becky herself explored. That's this idea of productivity. Um, you kept talking about how women throughout history had been valued for their ability to produce their productivity. Now, given the examples that you gave, your references to art and literature, and your references to various historical figures, I couldn't help that you were thinking mainly of fecundity, if you're thinking about women as a generative power. I mean, you talk about Cleopatra. Well, Cleopatra's power was entirely tied up with arguments about the ability to produce an heir and how central that was to supporting different types of systems. So if you talk about productivity in that way, you're touching on some kind of gender essentialism. You're talking about the fact that women have children and men don't. And that's a pretty important factor when we're thinking about things both political and economic and social and religious and more. And it's, I mean, that's something that I'm sure every panelist could have something to say about. But productivity is also more than that. When you allow women to function in the public realm, if you do not restrict them educationally, if you do not restrict them politically or economically, then there's all sorts of other ways in which they can magnify their productivity in the same way that men have been allowed to magnify their productivity throughout history. So there's obviously a specifically uh, feminine aspect to productivity that really needs to be addressed. You can't leave it out when you're talking about uh, church organizations, when you're talking about um, you know, questions of uh, equal pay and equal work and so forth. But similarly, you can't get yourself locked into one definition of productivity mm -mm. because there's so many other ways in which all human beings can pre be productive in relatively equal ways. So I'd like to hear more about productivity. Well, from everyone. I, I think that I uh, didn't make myself clear then because I was trying to say that over a long period of time, uh, the measurement has changed and that measurement of productivity has changed. And I did say at the outset that I think we're way too young in this conversation. We're, way, we're just not far enough into the conversation to really understand uh, the complexity of our measurement. But I would say, given Karen's uh, three areas, that we are trying to uh, say that women are uh, equal if they have power and money, if they can tell people what to do and make them do it, and they get paid well for it. And my point is simply that that productivity has a myriad of expressions, and uh, I think uh, I think that um, uh, the idea of uh, the artist is a very very uh, important place to find a productive uh, area because you are affecting, and this is a long conversation. It's a it's a long conversation about how the arts, how music, how drama. Uh, per, how they uh, affect us and how productive they are. So I think I'm going to hang on to my words and I'm going to force the conversation to define them and then I think we will be refreshed by the, um, the myriad of options that will actually bring us together in our ability to, to go forward as a public civil uh, society. Any other comments from the panel on that? Comments on 
if folks don't mind, I actually have a couple of points I'd like to make on that. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm an academic as well. I'm working on my uh, master's in history, and this really kind of touches on some of the things that uh, I've been working on the last uh, couple of years, which is that uh, productivity certainly exists at all levels and always has. Women, women have never stopped being productive. Right. Uh, even in the most restrictive of cultures, they continue to produce, especially creatively, uh, the arts, etc. But it's a question of how the culture, the overarching culture, values their productivity. Looking specifically at Japan, because I spent, ironically enough, a lot of time studying at Japanese women's history, in the Han period, women, it was a matriarchal society at that point, women with leadership, and the first uh, written language was developed by women in Japan. The first novel, first poetry that was written down was from women. It was highly valued. As the society then moved into the samurai period, the shogunate, things changed. And while women continued to do the same thing they'd always done, it was no longer valued. It was now denigrated oftentimes by society. And that changed the entire viewpoint and perspective of everybody, of women's worth overall, because what they were producing was no longer valued by society. In our society, I would argue that what our society values for production out of women is children. What our society values as being truly a contributing member of society being productive is leadership and money. And that brings us then back into the points that Karen was making. And I, I don't think there's any escaping that argument. Well, women certainly are productive within our society. They have never stopped being productive. Our production is often undervalued by our society right now. Right. I was reading, um, and I, I wish I had notes here on it, um, but that the, the whole Women's History Month that we just came out of, came out of a week-long celebration, is that correct? I think from some community in, in California that recognized that as far as women's history, or as far as um, history being taught in schools, only about 3% of it centered around women. Um, so that's where the so that's when they, you know, we've started this whole Women's History Month. I would love for there not to have to be a Women's History Month. I would love for it to be incorporated into everything that we that we teach all the time, you know, so that we could do away with that. Um, but that's where I think we 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 don't we haven't valued our women in society and contributions to society and and appreciated that we're not teaching about we haven't taught what the women have done historically and um and you, becky you mentioned women have always been valued in society but oftentimes almost in the form of property um they're valued because oh you mentioned helen of troy you know using women's beauty um so i don't I don't really think that's the best value of women. I think you have to be very careful when you approach any issue to limit your, uh, to limit your thinking at first. You have to come to an opinion because you will have to act and there will be a vote and all those things will happen. But in this forum at this time, I think that we are, it's incumbent upon all of us to say the what ifs. I think we, uh, the ideas of property are another great symposium. The ideas of how does ownership emerge? What's the history of ownership? Uh, how come, I tried to make the point at the beginning that, that the family as the organizing principle of early societies was replaced by the power of the state. When you come to Greece, you know, in Rome, you're starting to formalize the polis, the people. You're getting distinctions between how power flows up and down and why it flows up and down, why it should flow up and down. And then you come to the church where it's perfectly horizontal. The idea of the kingdom of God is genderless, and that's why it's close to song. 
uh, when we can sing, and when we can tell stories, when we can relate to one another without politics, without power, without money, we will get the we will get the the we will get the best story. And the the kingdom of, of God, whether you believe that that's now or later, whether you believe in it at all, as a philosophy, presents genderlessness. There's a marvelous history that was given to me by David Cullen by a gentleman named, uh, I'm going to say this wrong, I'm afraid, uh, Shank, uh, Shank, no, not Shank. Uh, uh, David, you're out there. What's his name? Stark. Stark. And it's a must read for, for people who want to see how the power of genderlessness within the church really moves civilization forward. And this is proved by another book uh, by a guy named Charles Murray who wrote Human Accomplishment in which men and women are, are equally as a, socio, a, socio, a social experiment, a sociology experiment. They are shown for their productivity in the arts and sciences, uh, in, in domestic and, and commercial uh, transactions. But the idea is when genderlessness is achieved, the highest use of everybody is accomplished. So in that way, we're, we're totally in unison. I think the ideas of ownership and property and productivity are part and parcel of that story. And in order to guide us right now, people who are in the midst of the discussion, uh, we need to be very careful. We need to get the academic in it. We need to get the historian in it. We need to get uh, ourselves better grounded in the ideas that we are manipulating at this time or that we're, we're handling. We have a... Go ahead and make your statement. I was just going to say, but it, with our English language, that kingdom of God automatically sets up gender because it's... Okay, just I'll that, use any because term it's king. You want to. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, really, I mean, I don't know if you want to use a, a, empire of God. Basically, what Jesus was saying is the kingdom of God is, or the empire of God is not the empire of Rome. I like. I I I, I agree with you. It's hard to it's hard to use terms that properly convey uh, enough. I. I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, good at it yet. I still rely on the ones that are ingrained in me, but I'm, I'm willing to call it a lot of things, but wherever we get rid of friction, uh, we're gonna be better off. But until we do reach that uh, homeostasis, I think it's incumbent on us to really identify those forces and to define them really well and to see how they actually work at doing uh, either damage or producing, uh, producing create, creative, uh, creatively. I just, I, I want us, uh, I want to, I want to hear from the church. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, Lacey, right, Lacey. Mm -hmm. I want to think uh, that Lacey's voice is as pertinent as mine, uh, and come to a good conclusion. I want Russell's question to being around in my head for a while. I just don't want to put it in a place where anybody's going to force me to do something. Uh, and that's power and money. That's, that's politics and, and uh, industry. And I, I don't want to put the conversation there. Well, and Becky, when I hear the word productivity, I mean, I immediately get really simple in my mind and think product and think, okay, women were called to be productive and produce products. And that just pushes against everything that's within me and how God has wired me. And so I'd rather use language um, of faithfulness. And as Christians, we're called to be faithful. So if we're gonna use different language than what the world would use, which is what we should use as Christians that we're in this world to be set apart, then the fruit that we bear, that God bears through us is not dependent upon ourselves. And so what faithfulness looks like for Lacey at 33 years old and newly married is different than what faithfulness looks like for Becky and for Karen and for Jenny. And so we're each given though freedom to run in those lanes and to be faithful that the Lord might bear through, fruit through us. And I think that releases a little bit of the pressure of 
I need to be a certain level of, quote, productive, and instead I'm called to faithfulness, not fruitfulness. And so that frees me, I think, of the productivity question as a recovering achiever and perfectionist myself. So. <laughs> Pilar, we have a question back here. Pilar? Um, we've got a question oh. up here in front. Yeah, I, I, I do have a question. Uh, a lot of times, most of the time, especially, did you say you were majoring in history or? Yeah, I'm working on my master's in history. Yeah. Historians don't really tend to make judgments until long after a period has passed. And I'd like to ask the panelists, when historians look back on this period, and, and they see Me Too, and they see what's happening, will they say, uh, will, will, what will the reasons be that this is happening now? Because these issues have certainly, as Becky said, been with us a long time. But something is taking place in our midst, and the historians are going to be looking for it. And, and I, I kind of want Karen to, to answer specifically, to in this respect. Ha, is there a male value set? Is there a male value set? And, and Lacey just touched on this. She said, productivity makes me uncomfortable, but faithfulness I'm into. Is there a male value set? that is proving itself to be sociologically bankrupt. And is that why we're going through something today that is unsettling to us, that is uh, destabilizing for us, but that seems to be uh, a very critical moment for us to get right if we're going to proceed along any kind of different course. Have, is there, and, and, and for Karen, I mean, and, and for genderlessness. I mean, we say genderlessness, but is there, is there a difference in values? Is there a fundamental difference in values? Or are women just as inclined to be focused on money, sex, and power as men? And so that what's happening today is just some kind of a, aberration, but it's really not going to change the direction that we're headed. Does that, sense, does that question make sense to the panel? Uh, is there a male va value set, value that, set. That, that history is going to look back and say, the reason this happened is because there was a fundamental failure in leadership and in values that they sensed, and they were trying to address that. I, I think I wouldn't say there's an overall male value set. The same as I said, there isn't a feminine, distinctive, one feminine voice. Um, I do think that men have historically, and I, and I still link this back to this whole women should, you know, this idea of women should be subordinate to their husband, the, this interpretation of, of the Genesis 2-3 text. Um, that men have felt, not all, and I don't mean all men, I, and I am a feminist, and some people think of that as, th that that's the other F word. You know, it, <laughs> really, um, it's not a bad word. <laughs> it just means that I, you know, I, I want to be considered equal to men. So, so it's certainly not all men. I, I love, I am married, I love my husband, I love men. But historically, men have um, been permitted, I guess, um, to treat women in a certain way, to treat women as objects, to see women um, sexually as opposed to other, you know. Um, and, and, and I really, and I know, you know, I, I was really trying to not get political tonight, but I do think a big part of the hashtag Me Too and women saying not anymore is because of who we elected to the presidency. I, I really think, imagine if a, if a woman running for public office had said, well, yeah, um, you know, I get a mouthful of Tic Tacs and start kissing any man I want to because when you have money, you're allowed to. And I grab them by the balls and they don't mind because when you got a lot of money, you can do that sort of thing. I mean, that's just, 
I, I really think that raised up in a lot of women uh, some feelings of this has got to stop. And, and this is our leadership that this is coming from. And this kind of language and this kind of talk about women has got to stop. And this kind of behavior about women has got to stop. Um, so I think that's why we had that hashtag Me Too um, at this point in history. Um, that's why we had the two women's marches. Um, yeah, and that certainly does not, is not reflective of all men. So. I again will say that I think it is a, uh, it is a, uh, uh, exclusive, you're being very exclusive, you're, you're making an abstraction out of power, you're saying it resides someplace in Donald Trump, and uh, that there is a, something really, 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 really important about him that we have to fight back against. And I don't feel that, I feel like he's nothing. I feel like he's there, and I feel like he's acting, and I, he, may, he may even be representative of this set of male factors. Uh, but I think that what we have to ask women to do is we have to say, uh, broad your ideas about power, influence, uh, worth, you know, and, and not be myopic about politics, industry, uh, and money. And that's where I think we're, we're going to be in a maelstrom on this issue until we allow ourselves to encourage uh, what we now think of as a, a marginal work. You know, it's an, old, it's an old deal. How important is the cleaning lady? How, how important is the garbage man? You know, every Christmas, I go give the garbage man as much money as I can find in dimes and quarters and nickels, and I hand him the whole jar we've, we've saved all year, and I say, I love you. Do not ever go away. You know, it's that, it's that, kind, of, it's that kind of expansiveness that if Russell wants me to talk about productivity, you know, it's that expansiveness. What is making things run? It's not Donald Trump. Okay. I, I'd like to um, piggyback on what Becky just said with my question, if that's okay. Um, I guess for me, and this is a very personal question for me, I'd like to ask um, our panelists about why there seems to be amongst many women, some of the voices that I've heard this evening, such a sharp dichotomy between the maternal impulse in women and this, and, and this idea of power in other realms. So it seems like what I'm hearing is either you can be valued for being a mother or you can be valued for being a leader. And I would like to ask why we don't understand the maternal role as one of the potential roles where leadership is exercised. And I ask this because so um, just to flesh it out a bit, when, when I was a child, I'm Canadian, when I was a child I wanted to be the first woman Prime Minister of Canada, and then Kim Campbell came along and spoiled my dream, so I wanted to be the first long-lasting woman Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> and then I came to a point where I thought that politicians were puppets and that lawmakers were the ones pulling the strings, so I wanted to be a lawyer, and then I wanted to be a judge. And then I decided, no, 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 it's really philosophers. Those are the ones who really make the, change the world. I wanted to change the world. And then I, I now have eight children. I have six biological children and two foster kids. And I really feel like I'm changing the world every day. And so, not to make this all about moms, but I hate, you know, I hate the, the whole mommy wars thing. I hate the whole, either you can go out there and get them, or you can stay home in the kitchen. I feel like I am shaping the minds of the future, and I think that that's an important thing to remember when we talk about women and their various roles. Many women will choose to bear children, and that's not a bad thing, and that's not a defection. It's not a relinquishment of power. I think it's an appropriate exercising a very important power. And I just want to hear some of your thoughts about that too. 
Um, sure. <laughs> I, I am a mom. I have two daughters, 14 and 19, and I think they're probably the best thing that I've ever done. Um, but I wanted to do something in addition to that. And I think a lot of women have come to the place that they want to do something in addition to being a mother. Um, at some point, I raise them and they get to go away. I had one go away <laughs> this year, and that's probably letting go of her and having her move out and go to college is the hardest thing I've ever done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's part of the reason I went back to get my doctorate because I figure when I'm working on my final project, my other one will be leaving and I'll have something to do uh, with my time. I love being a mother. Mm -hmm. I love my children. But I felt called to do other things and I don't think there should be restrictions on women because they feel called to be other things. And some women um, can't have children. So then what are they? And some women choose not to have children because that's not what they feel called to do. So I don't want to force anybody to do anything they don't want to. Right. I want the world to be open to everybody equally that's some pipe dream, I guess. But regardless of what your color is, or your gender is, or your sexual identity is, or your national, I don't know. I, I, I want the world to be open and options to be open for whatever pe people feel called to do. I, uh, I was a brat. Ask my brother. I was selfish. I was, uh, I was the only girl. I had every... I had everybody's attention, and I took advantage of it. And then I got a good education, and I became less self-centered. And there I married a good man, and we had eight children, and that was a different kind of lesson. And now I run a school full of kids and wonderful faculty, and that's another kind of lesson. Uh, in my life, Children were important, but they weren't exclusive at all. I really agree with Karen that there was a, there was timing the whole, the whole way. It was when I was having children, uh, I kind of forgot what time it was and had eight, you know, and just kept going. But uh, I'm happy they're grown. <laughs> and you can ask all my kids whether grandma's available. And I am, my heart is with them. But if they can do without me, I'm having the time of my life <laughs> running my school. And uh, I, I, think, I think we do value, I think in this country we still very, very highly and, and almost sacredly uh, love our mothers. Uh, and mothers love having children, but I do think that there are, there are choices that women can and should make and that, uh, that over time, Bearing children is uh, it's a great it's a great way to use from age twenty to age fifty, you know. But you're going to be there for a long time. Medicine's going to make sure we're going to be here till hundred. So Karen and I are going to use fifty to hundred. <laughs> she's going to change politics, and I'm going to change education. We'll see on the other end. And I would just say, um, <clears throat> as a woman who would love to be a mom, and I hope to be a mom someday. Uh, the Lord didn't intend for Lacey to get married until she was 33. So I get some kind of weird looks in Christian circles of the fact that I'm 33 years old, and we don't have any little Stevenson twins running around anytime yet. Uh, but in that, I just want to encourage you that, that when Jesus tells Peter to feed my sheep, you've got eight little sheep to feed who are always in demand and have many different demands, and each of us have different sheep to feed. And so Karen's seeking to feed different sheep other than in addition to her daughters and Becky's feeding different sheep at school and Jenny's feeding different sheep. And so I just want to encourage you that, as you were saying, those two aren't, in fact, yeah. distinct and separate from one another. We're actually running in the same lane. We're just feeding different sheep. Some are five years old and some are 50 years old. So thank you for your question. Did you have something? Um, I was just going to say, that, um, 
There's some really cool uh, women that I look up to in the community. Um, Janelle King's one of them. Shane Gross is another. Um, really brilliant uh, business owners in the creative arts. Uh, when I go to their establishment, all their kids are, I mean, these women are like jungle gyms. The kids are hanging off their arms. The women are doing invoices for their business. It is so cool to see that. So motherhood being stuck in the kitchen with your kids and then, and then such a separation of power. I, I know that that exists, but I refu all I see is I go to the workroom, I sit and I watch Janelle with her babies and watch her try to juggle her business. That is so cool to me, the hustle of, of, of combining that. I also am very blessed to know some amazing single dads who are totally moms, totally the whole package deal, and they still got to do the hustle. They still got to do their job. When they get home, they make their kids grilled cheese. I mean, I, I guess maybe I'm just blind to the, those roles being so separate. I, I'm also not as embedded in the church community as, as the panel is, so I see kind of a, a broader spectrum, but um, yeah, I see the parents are, are struggling and bring those, those two powers together, so I don't really see that separation as much. And I'd like to raise one question. Maybe it's just a question for everybody to ponder as we get to our next uh, audience question here. But why does it have to be an either or? Yeah. Nobody ever asks a man about whether he wants to be a dad or a businessman, a dad or a minister. It's presumed that he can do both. Why does it have to be either or for women? And the second part of that is, I've got a son graduating high school this year, finally. <laughs> Love him to death. But I would honestly say he will make a better mom someday than I ever did. He's got the temperament for it much more so than I ever did. Being that nurturer, which has traditionally been the women's role, I think we've denied many of our sons that capability through our culture. And we've got a young, uh, young lady up here up front who's been waiting so patiently to ask a question. Well, thank you for calling me young. Um, so I, I wanted to make a couple comments and ask a question of Lacey. First, which I would say is someone who has a son who doesn't fit all of the gender conforming stereotypes. Um, anytime we try to limit men or women and suggest that men only care about money, sex, and power, and women care about something different, then by definition we're limiting what they can achieve and be in life, and that has an impact on all of our society, not just women or not just men. And I wanted to clarify, Lacey, because what I felt like I heard when you spoke was that if someone speaks up about the marginalization of a certain group or the mistreatment of an individual or group, then they're claiming to be a victim, which is not something that is acceptable. And it seems to me that um, if people don't speak out, things don't change. And so I, I'm wondering, because it seems to suggest, what I heard you saying was that people needed to be faithful in God and that that would answer the question. And it seems to me that if people don't speak out in the church or work or education in all of those places, I can personally say I've experienced discrimination, um, then things won't ever change. And when we're talking about history, we're actually talking about thousands of years in which women haven't been valued. And so if we're going to wait for God to reveal something to us, it seems like perhaps he, might have, he or she might have done it by now. <laughs> Thank you for your question. I'll do my best to answer it, I think, succinctly to maybe bring clarity to what you heard me say and maybe what I didn't say clearly enough. Um, so with, with the movements and with women rising up and calling themselves victims, I just wanna, I think, acknowledge and call us to maybe ask, ask the question of ourselves: is 
what is the motive behind some of these things and um, of course the Bible would never command the mistreatment of women and um, I mean we are all of us in this room we could call all of us quote abusers if we're going to define abuse as the misuse of anything outside of its in intended purpose and so there could rise up in all of us to say I've suffered you know some of us have suffered at the hands of others or we just experience suffering in this world and so I think what I'm calling us to consider is what is what is a objective truth outside of our experiences that we can find comfort in and direction in and rather than being like swayed and um, not have something outside of ourselves only that what we've experienced and so um, I used to actually serve with a recovery ministry at a church and so I saw and experienced many different conversations with women who weren't Christians and you know who had different viewpoints and so I think my point is just to say that the answer isn't can't be in and of ourselves we're just going to keep having this conversation and kind of hit a dead end um, but I most certainly don't want to affirm women continuing to be abused and mistreated in the same way that men shouldn't be abused and mistreated and so I think I'm asking us to just kind of put on a new lens um, and you bring up the great point of we're all we're all awaiting the kingdom. I mean, I was kind of hoping that Jesus would come back before 845, but he just hasn't <laughs> yet. So we are, we are hoping and awaiting the, the better day where all sin and all suffering and all discrimination and all marginalization and all abuse will in fact come to an end and we won't experience suffering at the hands of others. And until that day, we have hope that God will make all things new. And so... I, I would just caution, respectfully caution you, Lexi, in assuming what other people believe. And, and I mean, we don't know that everyone here is Christian, and, we, and all Christians don't think alike. So, for example, I don't foresee the coming of the kingdom, the empire of God, is in our midst. So there are differences, and so assuming that we all, it's just a phrase that you, you tend to use that speaking for everyone, so. And that's a really good reason why we're up here together is because the, at the school, uh, we teach uh, dialogue. We talk, we talk, we talk, we talk. And dialogue means, uh, it means through. Dia means through, and logos means the word. And we're all, there's something in the center that's bigger than all of us. I think, I think everybody feels that. We're, we're not alone. <laughs> Some, there is something else. And it's bigger, and we need to know it. And uh, we define it at the school as the logos. It sets in the center. And it, it doesn't change. There is something immutable. And we, we're all talking about it, to it, through it, to each other. And I think that that's the purpose of the New Symposium Society, and that's what is so important. This room should be filled. Everybody here should, should try to become a panelist, and everybody should bring the next person so that we do have this, this great conversation about any issue that we want to have and, uh, uh, and bring perspective. I, I commend uh, Karen for that caution, is that don't ever, don't ever say that you know what somebody else is thinking until you spent a lot of time talking with them. And I, I tend to believe that I am going to find a great deal of common ground if I stay with somebody long mm -hmm. enough. And that's why I advocate for relationships in a place, uh, I'm, I'm here, I'm staying here, I'm not going from here, I'm with you, uh, I'll be part of you, and we will, we will, uh, we will, we'll gain what ground we can. But I think that's an important factor in the success of, of uh, well, Laura, we have two more questions, but yep. I think we'll have time. Okay, so we've got. Yep. Short questions, short answers. <laughs> okay. I don't know if we can promise short answers. <laughs> Right. We'll try. 
my question is for Jenny. Uh, gender is a complicated and really personal thing, and you had a personal story that I think spoke to that powerfully. And if you don't mind, I am interested in a little more insight into your story. Um, you talked about when you were in high school, you were very outgoing, you were blonde, you wanted to be a rock star, and some things about that and about you have changed since then. Um, you are no longer presenting yourself in as much of a traditionally feminine aspect. You know, Thank you're you. wearing clothes that are more traditionally masculine, um, but you're singing and interacting with kids, which is also in some ways traditionally feminine, more so than rock music is traditionally. Um, this is a, a, an interesting shift that you've made. And, and in that process, do you feel like your journey has allowed you to shrug off some things that were really not a fundamental part of you at all, after all? Or have you reshaped those things about yourself to let you get some of what you wanted in terms of music and performance with less friction and conflict? Those both seem like totally valid, believable answers. What's your answer, and how do you feel about it? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, I think, um, uh, just to uh, correct you, I was not a rock star in high school. I was an annoying, like, popular person. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah. <laughs> I, 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 I hope this answers your question. Um, I noticed that I was getting less, uh, I was making less connection when I um, was uh, a specific, when, when I was, oh, this sounds terrible, when I was uh, confidently fem feminine. I was getting less of a connection, less, uh, I was taken ser less seriously. Uh, hmm. p promoters, uh, again, venue owners or agents weren't um, engaging with me in a really like, uh, I don't know how else to say, like very responsive or uh, until I was genderless, until I was, until I let that go. And I've even noticed the way I talk now is different. I've, I've heard recordings from uh, when I w was younger. My S's were cleaner. I've really looked into that. Like it was like this, it was like that. And, and over time, I'm like, hey, what's up? I like, I, I've changed my whole, because this is what allows me to be able to sing to the most amount of people. This is what allows me to be able to get in, in, gain, people, gain people's trust in the most amount of way to where I can uh, express myself. Sing in a feminine way. I think that goes back to just the music I was raised on. Bolero and very, uh, very haunting uh, uh, Mexican folk singing. Um, so a female voice, but then very heavy amplifiers. Uh, Chopin, my father loved Chopin, and very dark classical music. So combining those two, um, I think that that doesn't have anything to do with uh, woman or male. That's just what I remember hearing as a child and building stories off of those in my head. So I think I've changed my um, persona, and even if I'm going for a walk, and I don't know if any other females up here know, know what I mean, but if you're going out for a walk or if you're going for a bike ride, you have to to avoid honks and people yelling at you. The outfit that I wear now, turtleneck all the way, sweats. I mean, <laughs> to cover up any, so you can't see any shape at all. It's, it, and that's what I have to do to be able to go for a bike ride. It's like, come on. But anyway, I, I, I morph to be able to be as free as possible. I don't know if that answered your question. No. All right, and one more uh, question up here in front. Mm, okay. Well, it's interesting that, uh, well, I just want to invite all of you uh, on the stage to come to any of our events. They've always been open. They've never been intentionally exclusive in any way. And uh, anybody, I mean, Becky could have always been, she was there from the beginning. Anytime she wanted to be on the panel, she was always welcome. So uh, I just think that the, the, what we come down to is that there are there are differences between sexes, and, and that's good. The problem, I think, and maybe you can, and I'll ask you a question that relates to this, is that we have an incorrect idea of what it means to be important and valued. And I think that's what Becky seems to be trying to help people to understand, that the more valuable person is not necessarily the one that makes more money, the more, the more valuable person is not necessarily the one that speaks up in front of people. The more valuable person is not, you know, the, the, they're not more valuable. Jesus was serious, I think, when he said, whoever wants to be great among you must be servant. And whoever wants to be greatest must be a slave of all. And he 
died for us. He, and he spoke through men. And of course, he is obviously you know, an evil woman hater because he only chose 12 men to take the message out. That doesn't, is that true? So the question I would ask is, each of you, which is more important, the mother or the father? Mm. <laughs> the, the aunt. <laughs> now, aunts can't bear children, so which is more important, the mother or the father? Oh, you don't expect me to make a choice, do you? Philip's been there all along. I would have died without him. He would have died without me. The children would have been destroying the world if it hadn't been for both of us working on them simultaneously. The most important person in my house is sitting right next to me. She's the well, most important and, person. And she says that exact same thing and about she, you. She, that's the, she that's might the, say that about me, but I, you know. No, that's the mutual I difference. know it's true, but it says submit to one another in love. But you know, God does put in a decision maker in the house. And when I make a decision, it's because I've talked with her, you know, or it doesn't get followed along with very well. Let me say that. Do you mean like which is more important, the, the mother role or the mother who's, who's more important? Because there are same-sex couples who, who one, is the, one plays the maternal, one is the maternal, you know, nurturer in that way, and then the, and then the other person, uh, you know. Well, the one that has the baby is the mother, and the one that provides the sperm is the father. See, this is going to, yeah, I better. This is Let, not. Ladies and gentlemen. This, this is why. Yeah, this is another symposium. This is where, this we're done this where. evening. Yeah. We, I, I like to quit on time. Let's thank our moderator and panelists for their participation this evening. Thank you so much.